Hello everyone and welcome to the next edition of Let's Talk Accountable Care. My name is Carson Porter with Accountable Care Law and Policy and we're joined today by Craig Bim who's with a company called Midkai and I'm going to ask Craig to explain what that's all about in just a minute. But you need to know that they are seasoned experts in ACO development. They're one of the few people in the country who can boast that they've created three different ACOs all in the state of Maryland. They have an affiliation with the Maryland Medical Society and it's a very interesting approach to the ACO industry. So with that, there's a little bit of background, Craig. Why don't you explain a little more about your organization, your role, and what you're trying to accomplish? No, of course, and thank you. And um, season expert might be a generous term. <laughs> but um, so, as you said, MedCai is the Maryland State Medical Society. Um, part of the mission, of course, is, is looking out for uh, physician, um, uh, physician prosperity and population health. Um, when the ACO program and the Medicare Shared Savings Program um, was established, uh, MedCai, both physician and staff leadership, saw a very positive opportunity. And so um, I was lucky enough to be in the opportunity working for a subsidiary of MedCai called MedCai Network Services. And um, the MedCai board and CEO um, said, let's go for it. Let's see what we can do. Um, so we traveled around the state to our uh, physician members and suggested that if they have any interest at all in an ACO, then MedCai would be in a good position to help them form one. Good. Um, we hit a couple different pockets, um, actually in rural areas, which was even better. Yeah, that's one of the points we want to underscore for the audience today is the fact that they're operating in small communities, rural areas in Maryland. Now, most of us, as Craig pointed out in our conversation earlier today, don't think of Maryland as being much of a rural state. You think of Baltimore and Annapolis and a few places like that. But there's a lot of farming communities across Maryland. There, it's funny. Um, the vast majority of population is in that 95 corridor, kind of right in the center. Right. Um, but most of the land is kind of everything else. Um, and so we, in the first round, or in the second round of ACOs technically, um, a little over a year ago, um, had interest from the small groups of primary care physicians um, in far western Maryland, uh, which is pretty much drive west until you hit Ohio, then come back 20 right. minutes. Um, and then also on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, and then this past January, we had interest from a group a little bit farther down the lower shore of Maryland. Um, so it's, it's three different pockets of, of rural physicians. Uh, it's probably about nine hours from one to the other extreme across the state. Did they have common issues or were there distinct problems with each group? Um, I would say both. Okay. It, um, we were first, we were very fortunate, um, first in the revised uh, Medicare Shared Savings Program regulations fact that all of our ACOs are uh, one-sided risk models. So there was no financial risk from that perspective. Um, They're also advanced payment, aren't they? Yes. And that's I'm sure that was attractive. Incredibly important. So the first you know, the first barrier was no risk to the physicians. And that was um, both MedCai leadership um, and the physicians also no risk. Um, the second barrier was that uh, these small independent practices are independent practices for a reason. Um, so they did not want to give up their MPI numbers, they did not want to form a single tax ID, um, which of course they were allowed to remain independent right. as participants. And then the third was because these are in rural areas and there are only small independent primary care practices, they were eligible for advanced payment. Are you using the advanced payment to implement EHR? Um, not in probably the traditional sense. Okay. Um, so we were, it was both a blessing and a curse that in all three ACOs we had very, very high EHR adoption already. Oh really? In rural Maryland? It was... That's shocking to me. It was shocking to us. It, of the three ACOs, we probably have 25 practices. I would say 22 already had purchased an EHR. Well, that's impressive. Um, well, you, then you're obviously dealing with sort of what you might call cutting-edge entrepreneurial physicians. In a sense. Um, the problem is that the scope of, of purchasing an EHR to implementing and being a successful meaningful user is a very broad scope. Yes, I agree. Um, so we did have some very entrepreneurial groups. Um, I would say, uh, to their credit, I think any physician that joined us um, was very forward thinking. Um, and we were very happy and impressed to see that in the rural areas. Um, but it is a, certainly a challenge to work with different levels of EHR use and um, and trying to get these different systems kind of up to the same place. What percentage of your member participants are primary care physicians? 100%. Oh, so there's no specialists at all? There are no specialists. So, you uh, contract with specialists? We aren't yet. 
Um, so the timelines pushed a lot of our policy around the ACOs. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say it was strategy, but a lot of it was just time. Um, so when we first formed them, we were looking at only primary care, um, and that was obviously the, uh, the beneficiary assignment right. came through primary care physicians. It also, as far as messaging and just kind of one of the key benefits of the ACO program is that small community practices, and mostly primary care practices, that have been suffering and, and seeing costs go up and reimbursements go down, um, are looking for some way to to push back a little bit, to to drive higher quality and lower costs in the system, but to maintain um, their ability to, to be a community physician. Um, so it really, I think, struck a chord with, with all of these groups. It sounds like you were playing the right notes, too. Yes, I think so. Okay. I think it was... How have, have you done it in integrating patient influence and, and feedback and so forth in your operations? I will practice this by saying it's been a slow process. Yes, um, we were starting with um, independent groups that they all more or less knew each other, but at their very heart, these are competitive competitors. Yeah, which leads to some interesting antitrust questions. Um, it certainly does. Um, and from an implementation standpoint, um, first of all, getting back to the idea of kind of the patient involvement and outreach, right. um, we've been focusing a lot on, on kind of change management issues, um, how to right. how to enter, how do you do work within the office better and more efficiently, more standardized, using best practices. Um, and we hope very shortly to work on much more kind of broader coordination, broader patient outreach. Uh, but it's been a long process. Is this a operational process issue or a culture issue or both? I would say both. And I would actually, I think it's more culture than operational process. Um, it's tough to get people to change their culture. It particularly is. Particularly Indian chiefs like these guys. It is. I mean, these are, are I mean, these are independent small business owners. Sure. And many of them have been in practice for, for 30 years. And so it, it's very hard to come in and say, you know, we know you're not certainly over-resourced. We know you're comfortable, we know your patients like you, um, but you need to change. You know, that is not, that's not a message that goes very far with any of these groups. How, did you have some who said, I'm not interested? Um, we've had a couple, um, a couple random groups in these different communities, but for the most part, um, because of the areas that we're looking at, um, it was really an all or none approach, um, especially uh, thinking of Western Maryland, there is a small community hospital, and three of our groups are in the parking lot around that hospital. Uh, the other two groups are just down the street, and that's every primary care physician in the county, essentially. Well, that should change the balance of power between the primary care physicians and the hospital. Well, it, it does, yes and no. Um, Maryland's a unique state anyway, right, because, um, of rate because of our rate setting system. So, why don't you take a moment and explain it? Because there will be a lot of people watching this interview who are not from Maryland and may not understand the setup we have in Maryland. So, I'm not sure I can <laughs> explain it thoroughly, but so Maryland um, is the only state in the country that has a rate setting commission which sets the payment schedule for all inpatient services um, from all payers. Um, so, essentially, instead of a hospital negotiating separately um, with CMS and Blue Cross Blue Shield, right. there is a rate that is paid for a service or a treatment. It operates sort of like a public service commission, doesn't it? It does. You have to apply each year to get your rates approved? Yes. So this is probably both good and bad. Um, the, and I won't touch on the bad because I don't know very much about the politics or the hospital yes. structures, but the good is you think is there's that, politics involved? <laughs> I think that's a safe assumption that normally. The good news um, is that Maryland, because of this structure, um, the, the Rate Setting Commission, the Health Care Commission, all these different groups, um, have been very forward thinking. So they've done, I don't mean to stray too far, but they've done a unique thing where they put hospitals essentially on a capitated payment program, right. um, which has been a challenge for the hospitals, of course, but has been very positive for the ACO program. Um, for the first time, possibly anywhere, um, you have hospitals that are trying to decrease utilization, that are very focused on decreasing um, unnecessary emergency department utilization, and readmissions, and trying to decrease readmissions. And 
what the ACO has done in each of these regions is given the hospital um, a group that has the time and the resources and capacity to have a good dialogue about what do you want to do to lower your utilization and what can we do to help you. Have you had any competition from the hospitals in wanting to employ physicians where you've been? Not in the past year. Um, I mean, like anywhere else, there certainly is um, a trend towards hospital employment. Um, I think that maybe because of these rural areas, uh, because of the geography, or because of uh, maybe just history, um, groups that were going to be employed, I think, have been employed. I think you're probably right. But it does amaze me, as a person who's been around healthcare for a while, that we went through the whole employment of physician practice 15 years ago or something, maybe 20, mm -hmm. and then they dismantled all that. Right. Right. So to the extent you see people doing it again, it kind of causes you to scratch your head. Yes, especially when you see the data yes. on cost per employed physician, not revenue per employed physician. Well, we'll see how it all shakes out. I think you guys are on a better path. I hope so. But I do want to penetrate a little bit about patient involvement because, mm -hmm. as we know from the regulations, they like for you to have representation on your board of at least one patient. They want to make certain that you, you have satisfied patients, and I assume you have some sort of data collection point in order to be able to do that. They also are required to give notice to patients that they are being served by an ACO and they're right to opt out if they don't like it. Yep. How have you found that experience? Um, I would say positive. Um, it certainly, we have not done anything earth shattering yet. Um, we have, uh, of course, done the opt out. We, of course, have um, the beneficiary involvement on our boards. Um, we're lucky that in each of these small communities, um, as we were forming the ACOs, the first thing we did was say, you know, do you want hospital involvement? Do you want um, what level of patient involvement? And who should be a good represent representative? And there was always names that, that the physicians threw out. Um, and they've been, it's been an incredibly um, powerful tool to have beneficiary involved. Um, I think that's a good idea. I mean, the customer ought to have a say. Of course. And especially in these, and this might be kind of biased towards the rural small towns, but the physicians care too much about their patients to not give them a say. Well, you know, you raise a very interesting point. And you have more experience with it than I do. But uh, my observation over the years has been that people who go to small towns go there for a reason. And, one, and two of the things I speculate is, one, they want less red tape and less pressure from the hospital for admissions and things like that. So they want to be left alone a little bit. And secondly, they know that they are important members of their community and they get more involved in the community. Whereas if you're in Baltimore, you can be anonymous yeah. when you're no longer at the hospital or at your office. Do you find that to be accurate? Yes. There is definitely the sense that if a, if a physician were to ever, and I hope they never would, but if they were to ever put cost or some, some negative motive ahead of patient care, that that patient would run into them in the store Right. and they would hear about it. Um, so I do think even though all our policies, all our goals, all our intentions are, are driving quality with the hopefully safe assumption that, that improved quality will decrease cost through hospital utilization and other things, um, there is certainly the underlying pressure from all of our physician members, all their staff, and all our their patients to always be doing what's best for patients. Well, if you can keep that foremost in the organization, you've got a winner. Yep. It was funny, when we first did the outreach, um, of course, we brought around participant agreements. And the two sections I showed every doctor, probably the only two sections they really cared about, although we told them to read all of it, um, one was the opt-out clause. They could leave any time with notice. So that reduces the risk. And that was the risk reduction. And the other one was the section that said that the physician, the participant, is ultimately responsible for all patient care decisions. We like that. Our medical director can give guidelines. We can urge them based on data to take certain actions. Um, but at the end of the day, whatever is right for Mrs. Smith is what's going to get done. Um, what role are you taking in uh, compliance programs for these people? I assume they all had something of their own when you brought them together. Although being in rural America, maybe not something terribly sophisticated. I'm talking, of course, about regulatory compliance, fraud, mm -hmm. abuse, anti kickback, all of those types of things. I did not suggest that your people engage in that, but it is important that they have compliance plans in place and they understand what they say. Of course. Um, so at this point, um, the ACO has a compliance officer and, and its own compliance plan. 
uh, we're currently sticking um, probably just to the tip of the iceberg um, through the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Um, we're not combining any broader integration or, or data sharing or clinical work outside of the assigned beneficiaries. Um, and we've given a very high level support to compliance plans, make sure physicians um, are doing what they need to do within their practice. Almost to the same extent that we're helping with meaningful use and kind of other broader healthcare and practice issues they need to be aware of. Um, but we haven't yet, I'd say, broken down the wall of, of antitrust, any kickback, kind of stark issues as we look at potentially um, what the ACO can do with other payers or with a broader population or um, with kind of with other programs. Let me ask you one other question. It's been my observation that the post-acute community can really have a major impact on reduction savings, particularly by preventing readmissions to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And when Granny leaves and goes to the nursing home or something, they don't want her back. Right. And, and she doesn't want to go back. She doesn't want to go back, <laughs> and if she goes back, they're not going to get the savings that they want. Yep. So are you interfacing with local post-acute people officially or just sort of ad hoc? I was going to say, so not officially. Um, we have seen, and this is probably another aspect of rural areas, a number of our participating physicians are also medical directors of their local uh, nursing facilities. Right. So there's certainly um, that philosophical overlap they bring with their doing the ACO back and forth. Um, in Western Maryland, we actually just got the opportunity um, through the Healthcare Commission and our state health information exchange to apply for a, a connectivity grant, a challenge grant to help um, with the data flow between two separate nursing facilities, um, each other, community physicians, and the hospital. So, That's interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a neat program based on... It's called a connectivity grant. It's actually a challenge grant. Challenge grant. Um, it, it from CMS? It's, I believe it was awarded from the ONC through the Maryland Healthcare Commission oh, okay. and, um, and our health information exchange is called CRISP, the Chesapeake Regional Information yes. System for our patients. Um, but the goal is, CRISP has uh, established, I think to their credit, um, a very powerful notification service and query portal. Um, and it's connected to all 46 acute care hospitals in Maryland. Oh, really? But they're actually, it's, they're very far along um, on the inpatient side. They have a lot of work to do on the outpatient side. Um, which is something, of course, MedCA is um, helping with. Um, but this grant is to help encourage the nursing homes and the community physicians to communicate uh, with each other through direct messaging and to get the notification services and to act upon notifications from the hospital. Well, that's very, I think that's fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's, I wouldn't call it unique, but it's unusual. Yes. And it's, um, hopefully, it, it's one of those, just like with the rate setting, the line hospital and ACO incentives, um, this is aligning the, the CRISP HIE with the nursing homes, with the hospitals, and the ACOs. And it, um, it, we're very optimistic about it. Well, it's innovative, and, and I think the more innovation in the care delivery and analysis piece, the greater the likelihood we'll have savings. Definitely. You know, there's the triple aim, improve the population health, improve patient health, individual patients, and reduce costs. That may be a very innovative way to get at that. I hope so. Well, I hope so, too. Would you like to share anything else that we haven't touched on with our audience? Any topics that uh, you think would be of interest to them or be unusual? No, I think um, touching on the fact that we somehow found rural areas in Maryland to do yes. this, um, the partnership with the Medical Society, I can't stress enough, has been a very powerful um, motivator, both on the physician side because it built the trust and credibility, um, but then just like the patient care and the underlying patient concern is going to drive good intentions. Um, the medical society and the mission um, is going to drive good intentions. So it's um, it's been a very, very positive collaboration. One final question. You are in the part of the business chain that basically operates the ACOs, correct? Yep. Are you available to consult with people who might be watching this interview if they want to follow up with you? And or, and or is your organization interested in moving outside of Maryland into other jurisdictions? Or is that premature to discuss? Yeah. I'm always incredibly happy um, to talk to anybody about, about ACOs, our experience, and um, what we can do to help. Um, as I said, expert might be a generous term. I'm not sure anybody's an expert at this point. Well, seasoned uh, might be generous too. Right. right. Premature. Premature. Because nobody's seasoned. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but we do, we are building, um, through advanced payment, we're building um, a very powerful uh, IT infrastructure 
and uh, case management infrastructure. And it, I'm hoping it will become a very powerful tool, um, whether in the ACO program or just other, other um, quality improvement programs. So I'm certainly very happy to talk to anybody. Well, there you go, folks. You heard it from the man himself. He's available to give you advice, so take advantage of it. <laughs> Well, Craig, thank you so much for your time oh, it's today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, we learned a lot of interesting stuff about a rural-oriented ACO that I didn't know, and I'm sure our audience didn't know, but I think it's very encouraging that you've been able to launch in rural communities because that's where I think a lot of the rubber will meet the road, but it's often ignored because yeah. you know the critical mass is so low. Yeah. Thank you again for joining us. Craig Bim with MedCA. I'm Carson Porter with Accountable Care Law and Policy, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Let's talk accountable care. Have a good day.